Hello and welcome to Alan History Nerd. In this video I'm going to be looking at the growth of the American economy in the 1950s and the idea of consumer society. So this is another one in my series looking at the A-level history specification 2Q, the American dream, reality and illusion 1945 to 1980. Uh, and this is from the section on Eisenhower tranquility and crisis 1952 to 1960. And we are looking more precisely at the growth of the American economy in the 1950s and the impact of the consumer uh, of the consumer society. Now, often the 1950s, particularly economically, are considered rather a, a golden age in, in American history. And, and what we've got on, on screen now is, is some of the evidence to, uh, to why. So, for example, in, in 1950, the GDP gross domestic product, which is essentially the amount of um, money generated by um, by the economy was three hundred and fifty five billion dollars. Ten years later, in 1960, it was four hundred eighty eight billion dollars. So this shows a substantial economic growth going through that 10 year period. I mean, the next one, I'm not going to get the fact, figures from 50, but the, the per capita income in 1940 was uh, was $1,740. Um, so that's how much how much money on an average year that an American would earn. In 1960, it, it had gone up to um, $2,699. So we've seen almost a $1,000 per capita increase um, in, in income. So this would suggest we're going to see an American population that was far, far better off. In the 1950s, the economy grew by 37% and the purchasing power of your average American family increased by 30%. So if you are 30% better off by the end of this decade than you, you were at the beginning on average, then this is going to feel like an economically really good time. It's going to feel like a golden age. Inflation was generally fairly low during this period. Taxes were low. Uh, and and we've, when we've looked at Eisenhower, one of the key things Eisenhower wanted to do was to balance the budget and, and he didn't believe in strong, an overly strong federal government, although he did intervene in the economy. So he, he tries to keep taxes uh, pretty low. Eisenhower will, however, stimulate the economy when it needs doing. And there are some good examples of this, uh, like the, his building of highways uh, and the soil bank that subsidized uh, American farmers uh, and um, helped maintain food prices. So we see that element of it from a government. We also see in terms of raw materials, America is incredibly blessed in terms of raw materials. One of the key ones in, in this era as we go into is oil. And the US had plentiful oil from its own oil wells and therefore tons and tons of, of gas, gasoline or petrol, as we would call it. And also, they, you still had this massive scale um, American manufacturing and Europe and Asia, as they were recovering following the Second World War, were buying US goods. So from that point of view, it looks like we are potentially looking at a golden era. So why was the economy growing like this in the 1950s? Well, there was a consumer boom driven in part by a shift from war, from war manufacturing to con co manufacturing consumer goods. Um, we, we see th things being started off by Truman's GI Bill, which boosted house building and improved education. And then this filters into into the 1950s, but there was a growing population. The baby boom started at the end of the war, continued um, through the 50s into the 60s, uh, and more children meant more spending. So, and the, the the part of manufacturing shift was to produce the stuff that families needed with with their kids. Um, and then what we see as we get to the towards the end of the 50s, the emergence of the teenager with money to spend on food and entertainment and other things like cosmetics and other things like that. And overall, the population grew from 152 million in 1950 to 181 million in 1960. So there are more people to buy more goods, to buy to, to the need to make more stuff. And we've also got this whole new demographic that, with disposable income, because although Teenagers aren't necessarily going to be high earners. What they are going to have is lots of disposable income because they'll be living at home. They're not paying uh, bills and rent and things like that. And therefore, the money they earn in their part time job is disposable. They can just spend it on on, on goods and, and they become an important market. There was massive demand that was driven by advertising, especially on, on TV. Uh, almost 90 percent of American households 
had the TV by 1960. Uh, and uh, money spent on advertising rose from $6 billion to, in 1950 to $13 billion in 1960. And one of the things to always ask yourself is, well, do, does advertising work? And I think numbers like that that's, that show the increase in spending on it demonstrates that it must. Otherwise, companies wouldn't have been doing it. Uh, and so this generated the consumer consumerism of the 1950s. People were told that they needed things by advertisers. Were manipulating, going, yes, I really want that, and they went out and they spent on it. One of the reasons why they could go and do that was because there was lots of cheap credit available. So some of this started off in, in housing with the Federal Housing Administration and the Veterans Administration, which, which lent people cheap loans to buy houses. But also in the 50s, we saw the advent of the, of, uh, the new phenomenon of the credit card. And it started with the Diners Club card, which was the idea was, was a way of paying in restaurants. Uh, and this was then uh, followed by uh, more cards for things like American Express and, and many more. And private debt went up from about $105 billion uh, up to oh, over $260 billion. So we're seeing a gigantic rise in private debt and we we've seen as, as time's gone on there's some of the issues that, that's harbored with this with large amounts of personal debt that people hold and the problems that that can lead to but at this point what it was doing was stimulating an enormous amount of consumerism and that then stimulated the economy and the economy grew so as we said for many this was a golden age so it brought great affluence so with access to consumer goods and labor saving devices and plentiful food and good affordable housing and travel and leisure time and activities things that that meant that in this era the a lot of americans were experiencing a standard of living that was way beyond um that they've been experienced by the previous generations so remember that the, we, we've had two world wars we've had the great depression uh, and Therefore, actually, the standard of living in the 1950s was something quite remarkable compared to, to the standards that pe most people have been living in before that. We also see a move away from manual work. Um, in 1960, a combination of service workers and white collar workers. Uh, so the white collar workers are the middle class. The service workers, a different type of work, but it's, it's not necessarily permanently paid, outnumbered the, the number of blue collar workers in the US. So the US had a, a growing and well off middle class. There's a growth of the car industry, which we'll look at a bit more in a little while, and the airline industry. And this opened up a whole range of new opportunities, including um, uh, travel, but also improved, improving connections for business. And also the car industry allowed people to move out into the suburbs. Uh, at home, we see sort of washing machines and freezers and dishwashers and other labor saving gadgets that completely transformed the lives of many families, and notably, uh, in particular, uh, housewives. In, in one of the, the kind of really interesting sources we see around this time is the kitchen debate, uh, which was held in 1959 in, in Moscow between um, Khrushchev and Nixon. And, and they had an exhibition which had a kind of an American um, kitchen on display. And the two of them talked about uh, what, what this showed. And Nixon said that this illustrates that the high standard of living that a steel, steel workers family could expect in California and the US. Uh, and Although Khrushchev pushed back against uh, what Nixon was saying, said this isn't true, and da, 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 all those kind of things, it actually led to Khrushchev demanding more consumer goods being produced in the USSR, made him think that the USSR in this element was falling behind the US. It's worth noting, however, that this was not a golden age for all. But there were two recessions, one in 54, which was fairly minor, and a much, a much more significant one in 58, which led to uh, 5 million people unemployed. Whilst the rich got even richer, particularly at the very top end of society, because there's all these new things to invest in that boomed. So if you were, if you put money into it and it grew, then you made loads and loads of money. But then so the rich got very, very rich. The middle class grew and it, it experienced a standard of living well beyond uh, what had been seen before for most people. Uh, but not all shared in, in, in this boom. Um, a lot of manual laborers were losing their jobs due to increased mechanization. So the machines were doing the, the building in the factories, the, the factory workers weren't needed in the same way. Uh, and there was a, a growing gap between the haves and have nots. Uh, ethnic minority groups still face discrimination, particularly African-Americans in employment and in housing. 
uh, they tended to be the first to let go if there was any kind of downturn and the last to be hired when uh, there was a lot of demand. And they were often denied promotions and there was talk of, of, of glass ceilings um, in, in, in businesses and industry. In housing, there were covenants keeping um, ethnic minority groups out of the suburbs um, and with white flight as the white population moved out of the, the towns and cities into the suburbs and the growth of, of out of town shopping malls. This led to a, a, a downturn or decline in downtown areas as that they faced a lack of investment and essentially uh, and with the socialist things at the time wrote about this, that essentially that the white the white middle class population could start to ignore these areas because they didn't have to go to them anymore. Um, in, in, following the war, a lot of women had lost their jobs uh, to men returning from the war. And, and, and although we can see the positives of women with all the labour saving devices and things for these housewives, they, a lot of these housewives faced quite dull lives at this point where they, they the, um, there was a huge push, push for conformity and everything that was going on. and, and but they 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 they'd had work in the 1940s in 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 the war years and now they that that kind of interaction had been taken away from them. Um, so th th there was a definite kind of a down downsize in that as well. So I'm going to look at some of the key aspects of the economy. One of these ones I mentioned already is the suburbs. Well, the, the, the suburbs it grew, grew enormously in the 1950s. There was 11 million new homes in the suburbs. Uh, and leading figures in this were the Levitt brothers, who were responsible for building suburbs all over the US. Uh, the first development was Levitt Town in, in, in Hempstead, uh, Long Island, to which they, they built 17,000 homes for about 84,000 residents. There were numerous village greens, shopping centres, bowling alleys and swimming pools. So there was amenities as well as these rows of rows upon rows upon rows of houses. Um, the houses were on big plots, much, much bigger um, than, than um, it had normally been the case for housing at, up until this point. Uh, and they, they would cost from about $8,000, which is about two and a half times our average salary. Um, if you look at a comparison in, in, for example, modern day Britain between uh, average house price uh, and average salary, it, you, then you, you're talking at multiples much, much, much bigger than that. So what that, that multiple means, the two and a half times average salary, that these were affordable, that, that normal, uh, normal working people could afford to buy them. Um, they were it built on an interesting system, again, some of the differences difference in, in climate with um, parts of uh, American parts of the UK. Um, they were largely prefabricated, um, but they were well built. They, they, sort of, they, they, they had this system where they could build them relatively cheaply, you could largely um, bring the component points, points to site, component parts to site, put them together on site. Um, a lot of the houses that were identical, so you'd have a brochure, you'd have about four or five, six different types of houses that you could have, and then and you, on, on these enormous estates there would be rows and rows in different places. And they, this kind of conformity was reinforced by, by living in these areas came with, with certain rules about how well you had to maintain your lawn, about when you could hang out your washing, for example, I suppose hanging out at weekends. Um, the, the, the rules about fences, about what was and wasn't around. There were, there were again, some really, really big control, controversies with this. The Levitts, for example, refused to sell to people of colour. And the first African-American family to move into a Levitt development were the Myers in Pennsylvania in 57. They bought, they bought the, the house secondhand. Uh, and they, they faced an, an angry group of 500 white residents outside their house. They had meetings with Martin Luther King and things like that. So, so we, we, the suburbs in a way were a symbol of um, of opportunity and, and development and, and this new high standard of living, but also in a way were a, a um, symbol of divided America where where the, this, this new opportunity was for some and not for others. And one of those divisions was on the basis of race. Another key aspect of the economy at this point was cars. Now, Detroit was the, the home, the center of the car industry. It was home of, of Ford and Chrysler and General Motors, who were the big three. Uh, amongst other car manufacturers as well. Up to 8 million cars were made e each year in the 1950s. About 4.5 million were scrapped. The number of cars keeps going up. And, and having the best and latest car became a key status symbol 
and so you'd have all your identical houses and your Levitt housing estates and things like that. And then on it, you, on your drives and your garages, you'd have all these nice new shiny cars. And and one of the bits was having the one that had all the latest gadgets, had had the biggest engine that that looked the most fabulous. Um, the cars were big, they were luxurious, they were powerful. They had things like automatic transition and all kinds of other gadgets and gizmos in them. Uh, they were colourful. They were um, covered in shiny, shiny bits of chrome, chrome bumpers and detailing. And they often had quite striking designs, kind of a symbol of American confidence and, and excess during this period. Um, having a car meant you could live in the suburbs and commute to work. Um, you could get uh, drive in food in your car. You could go and drive into a McDonald's, get drive in from McDonald's. You could watch a movie in a drive in cinema. You could even attend church in a drive in church. So you can do basically everything in your car. So you had your very luxurious car with all these different, with very nice comfy seats and, and, and it's automatic transmission, all that kind of stuff. And you could trundle around and do all your th stuff without ever really leaving it. Um, the highways had been built by, were being built by Eisenhower's federal government, and so and these soon became lined with hotels and motels and restaurants and fast food outlets like McDonald's and stores and shopping malls. Uh, and so again, the, the the cheap petrol and all those kind of things contributed to this, uh, and, and into a particular kind of American consumer uh, society in the 1950s. Uh, another key aspect of the economy was service and leisure. So uh, th those with money increasing needed places to spend it. Um, this led to a massive growth in the service sector with jobs in fast food outlets, shopping malls, etc. Um, some teenagers gained part time work in jobs like these. Um, service jobs overall, however, were not well paid. And again, in some of these areas of work, it's one of the bits where you, you, you could pick up on social division and, and racial division in America. You could see the kind of jobs that different groups of people had, were more likely to do at this point in time. Um, watching TV became a major US pastime and, and, and the TV was full of advertising, selling new products available at the shopping malls like the one in the picture above me. Um, sport became hugely popular, helped again by TV audiences. Um, and, and again, leisure time was was something that was was fairly new to people as people as people became more affluent and they had more, but then had to work the same number of hours and 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 the work around the house didn't take as long and all those kind of things. Um, we also see Disney opening its first theme park and, and Disney is one of the, one of those uh, companies that is actually thrives in fifties America makes. Uh, and 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 kind of the idea of memorabilia and, and toys and things like that and they they kind of. The consumer society, consumer society really feeds into to companies like Disney and and they're spread across the US and, and the kind of money they can make. And this is all kind of a symbol of that life has become homogenized, that everything was becoming the same. People were living in the same kind of houses. So there was the same housing as Pennsylvania as there was in Long Island and there wasn't bits in California and all, all those kind of things. They were so they were living in the same kind of houses in the same kind of suburbs, eating the same kind of food. Um, uh, watching the same TV programs, um, and, and so this started to knock some of the edges off some of the regional variations in the states, and, and started to make life quite samey across the country. Not necessarily bad, but it was pretty much everyone same. So this is the beginning of in the modern day. We talk, we've seen this spend spread out from America, which is about globalization, and every everywhere starting to look the same. When this was starting in the 50s in America, where everywhere was starting to to look and feel the same, and and you were going to McDonald's, you'd know what it was you were going to eat. And this leads us on nicely onto McDonald's, which is one of our, uh, the case studies I'm talking about. So Ray Kroc and McDonald's. Uh, so McDonald's is a really interesting case study, and obviously something that, that, that is, a, a, it, it is easily relatable in terms of um, modern day Britain as well. Um, the founders of McDonald's were the McDonald brothers, uh, and they started the company, but the man who transformed it into the massive brand that it became was a guy called Ray Kroc. Uh, and Croc essentially got the rights for franchising McDonald's. And, and the idea he had was it was selling individual McDonald's restaurant franchises rather than like whole areas, just individual restaurant ones. And it, this would allow the company to expand, while also allowing the company to keep close control of the standards and ensure uniformity across the brand. Because someone who owned one store was far more likely to have to, to, to abide by what the central company was telling them going to do, particularly if they then wanted to buy another one. And so they, they, they have this method of control and the brand proved to be really popular and this made loads and loads of money. 
By 1961, there were 228 McDonald's across the US. Uh, Kroc tended to focus on suburban locations, which he, he felt would bring in more money and would be more secure uh, and safer. He ensured that the food was the same in every restaurant, and there was a whole system around standardization of, of method of production and portion size, etc. Um, there was huge emphasis on cleanliness, and, and, and so the, the restaurants were clean, the staff were, were trained to, be, um, uh, to, to make sure they were really polite, uh, and particularly welcoming to children. And so the, the, this kind of model was then spread, and it, it proved to be really successful. Kroc then bought McDonald's uh, from the McDonald brothers in 1961 for $2.7 million dollars. Um, and meaning each uh, brother got $1 million after tax. Now, in 1961, $1 million after tax is a lot of money, um, but this obviously looks like really, really brilliant uh, business on Kroc's behalf. Uh, and Kroc, therefore, is a prime example of the American dream coming from a, a Czech American immigrant family and making a, a fortune in this new consumer society. And really pushing the, the, these ideas of consumption and um, uniformity, but that was a big, a big part of the 1950s and, and the, uh, the suburbs and the drive-in and all those kind of things. So, what are the positives about consumer society? Well, many look back into this period of American history, Americana, often is referred to with great positivity. Um, especially comparing it to the suffering of the 1930s, the Great Depression and the horrors of war in the 1940s, in which point the 1950s looks pretty good. Um, for many, life did improve. Americans had plenty of cheap food, consumer goods that they never had access before, good affordable housing. The majority of the world's cars were in America. They, they, the economy grew. People were, on the whole, better off. Unemployment was generally low. So was inflation. So were taxes. Now, the 50s then really becomes idealized by the conservative, the more conservative groups in America who tend to look back to the 1950s as a really idealistic time where the, the progressive ideas that flowed from the 1960s onwards had yet to strongly emerge. Uh, and, and that kind of conformity and nuclear families living in the suburbs, etc., uh, became a kind of a big part of the norm. So in American culture, you'll see lots of references to the 50s, and a lot of that reference will be very, very positive. There were, however, big negatives with consumer society as well. So first of all, not everyone was included. So and, and this is what can be a very divisive thing, where there are all these consumer goods and there's the TV telling you um, that you really need them and you should really want them. And that, but then lots of people didn't have the money and so they couldn't. And the gap between rich and poor grew. And the division on racial grounds was also very stark. Um, Michael Harrington's book, The Other America, showed how, in, in, how the move to the suburbs had made poverty easy for Ameri many Americans to ignore. And there's lots of writing and stuff at the time about how essentially the, the, we ended up with a, a kind of an empathy gap where where there wasn't the concern for the less well off that maybe um, the, the people who felt there had been before. Uh, TV, uh, TV and advertising promoted conformity. Um, I said some people thinking the Americans were people were being to an extent controlled. Historian David Potter warned of the power of advertising in shaping society, as did um, the journalist Vance Packard in, in his uh, his work uh, The Hidden Persuaders of '57. And there was techniques back then, such as um, subliminal messaging and in, 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 in cinemas where you it would be understandable to the eye but images of coca-cola are appearing and people not knowing they've seen it but have their brains taking it and they go oh you want a drink go buy that so there, there was lots of stuff happening where people were kind of go well everything's getting why is everything the same why is there no variation and that conformity and consumers in the 1950s actually becomes a trigger for the rebellion and counterculture that starts to develop in the 1960s and beyond. There's people, as groups of people, not everybody, but groups of people started to reject kind of the extreme materialism that they started to see uh, growing in the 1950s and the enforced homogeneity uh, they saw around them and becoming increasingly aware of the inequality that was kind of hidden between the, hidden between the gaps or in, if you went to the right places in, in very much plain sight. So, 
the the consumer society did bring economic growth and positives but there were also some bits in here that you might want to think about critically in terms of um well us culture as it's continued on onward from here and particularly at the time and that there were those groups who were being left behind and we start to see at, at parts of a divided nation um, coming out of this thank you very much for watching i hope that's uh, proved helpful to you if it has to please hit the uh, the like button if you have any questions or comments please leave them below um, i'm trying to get through and cover as much of this unit as i possibly can um, please do subscribe and get notifications and more of this is added there are also um, lots of other series of videos I've done on this channel on, for example, Tudor history and modern Britain and uh, Tsarist and communist Russia. Also some ancient history. There's also loads of stuff on UK and US politics, particularly helpful if you're doing A-level politics as well. So do subscribe. Uh, hopefully you'll find some interesting stuff on the channel um, just to entertain or hopefully to inform, particularly help you with any A-level studies. Thank you very much for watching.